And g'day fans, we're back talking about Star Trek Discovery. It's the fifth episode. Fifth episode. Oh my god, they're just rolling through like oranges. Ollie, you can almost do a bit of this if you wanted to. So there you go. That still counts as five. Anyway, it's Dags and MPS here with you to talk about the episode Die Trying. Now, with a bit of luck, you'll get through this episode before well, before you die trying, if that makes any sense. <laughs> it doesn't matter. MPS, how are you going today? What do you think of the episode, mate? Yeah, good. I, I thought it was uh, interesting in some parts. I, I noticed a few things. I don't know how many fans will notice these, but, uh, you know, I did have to put put a bit of a pause on it at some point to, to make some notes. But, uh, yeah, we will uh, get to those points shortly. So as is always the case with these shows, we start off with a little bit of talking from Saru and this is going on and that's going on. But the key thing is we got to see the Federation, the United Federation of Planets was just as big as it used to be. 350 down to 38. Oh my God, they're just like shrunk like oranges. So um, it was very, very, very cool. They're not actually on a planet whatsoever, which is what we originally thought. So they're actually in space, just floating around inside this like cloaking device or hiding from somebody. And all the way uh, our discovery guys get inside and it's like, oh my God, check it all out. There's stuff everywhere. So um, how good's that? What do you reckon? Yeah, they seem to be pretty um, excited to see it. I, I thought maybe they should have been on a planet. It would have been probably harder to find if you cloaked yourself on a planet. But the cloaking idea was was nice. And it sort of seemed like you were, the, the when discovery was entering, it was almost like you were walking through a waterfall. Mm. And then you see this amazing sort of like beautiful oasis. And it's funnily enough, it's all space blue. Yeah. You know, there's no other colors. It's just space blue, but it's cloaked behind something. It's like, is there a, a, a cheap rate for space blue in, on, on, um, on a set somewhere? It just seems a little bit crazy. That everything is blue, bluey white and all that sort of stuff. But it was good to see. Did you notice they, they showed the USS Voyager J? Yes. J class, which was the 11th or 10th, whichever you want to call it. Yep. Yep. But did you notice that on the left-hand side of screen, it was the USS Nog. Yeah, a lot of people have picked up on that, and uh, which is obviously a little nod to uh, Aaron Eisenberg, who uh, is no longer with us, quite, quite sadly. So that was a nice little gesture to him. So, yeah, a few fans have picked up on that one as well, which is kind of cool. So, yeah. It would have been nice to see a few more ships and, and make note of, of them, but uh, we'll probably see them later on as they pair up with Discovery and go on play missions, you know, like play date sort of thing, but a mission. It was kind of funny. They made a reference like some ships have got like organic hulls, right? And of course, me being a nerd, I thought straight away, it's like that's straight out of Babylon 5. Babylon 5 had, 5 had ships with organic hulls back in the 90s. So a little bit behind the eight ball on that one. But still, it sounded pretty cool, whatever it's meant to be. So you got to go and feed your ship, you know, some Palmetti bites or whatever just to keep it going. So, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure they'll investigate that one and uh, explore it a little bit further on. Um, you mentioned about how everything's always blue. And of course, Discovery, the TV series, by and large, is blue. They wear blue uniforms all the lights are blue but we finally got to see the federation dudes and the admiral was wearing gray i thought oh, finally there's no blue how good is that even though some of the background people were wearing blue so uh good old admiral vance got to appear in his gray uniform looking pretty cool so uh that was a uh, kind of groovy a 32nd century admiral from the federation starfleet yay team how good and that? you know who and you know who the actor was yeah, yeah, yeah. Odin something or other from The Mummy. Odin, uh, yeah, he's, he's been fantastic. He was in The Mummy uh, and he was in A Deuce of Bigelow. But yeah, for some of the things that he's, he's been in over the years. So he looked really good, but I did notice that a couple of the background um, crew members uh, from the 32nd version of uh, Starfleet had gone back to one-piece uniforms. It was almost like the next generation revisited I thought, I thought they'd done away with all that, you know, the whole one piece thing, zip it up the back and away you go. I thought, I thought everything was two piece, even Discovery's uniforms are two piece. So I thought that was kind of bizarre that they should do that, but maybe it's for the junior officers to make them suffer a little bit before they sort of climb up the ranks. So um, there you go. And that was the other interesting thing. We only saw the Admiral and whoever the, the two people that were mentioning missions to him about right at the beginning. We saw no lieutenants, captains, or any other ranked personnel at all. You know, you would think that some sort of mission that was so important. Yes, it would have gone to the Admiral, but it would have come from like a, a senior staff member. Why would you get some junior low rank to sort of come up and say, oh, by the way, this situation is, he should have turned around and, and almost done what he did to Michael and just turned around and said, look, shut your mouth. 
you know, get your senior to tell me what's going on because I really don't have time for all this rubbish. Yeah, that was interesting. A few people have picked up on the fact that almost instantly Michael was on the on the uh, offensive. You know, you know, the Admiral Van says, we've got to do this, you've got to do this, we're going to deploy the crew and all sort of business. And she's just like, no, you can't do that, you can't do that. And it's like, hang on. It's like, you just got to settle down there, son. You know, you've only just met this guy. you just got to cut him a bit of slack. And, it, and a few people have said, it makes a lot of sense that if you've got a crew who's arrived from the 22nd century or whatever, uh, that you would deploy them in different places because they've got all got to be brought up to 32nd century speed and technology, and they've all got strengths in different areas. So you do split them up. So uh, obviously it doesn't work for the TV series uh, and the narrative of the show, but in real life, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, it's just, you're just getting deployed here and getting deployed there. And it's just the way it goes. So, uh, and the crew has well, only been together for a year. So it's not like they've been together for the, a long, long, long time. Sure. They've been through a lot of adventures and they've done a lot of stuff. But, I mean, there could be some crew members on the ship in the lower decks who'd be going, Grouse, I'd love to be, like, assigned somewhere else. So it depends on how you sort of interpret uh, that particular sequence. See, I would have swapped it around. I would have had new people come in on Discovery to learn the ship because he reckons the ship's going to take an hour to learn and then fly off to... No, 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 no. No ship takes an hour to learn, you know. It's just... Mm. It's not possible. So I really like the idea that he was very suspicious of who they were. So it wasn't just like, Oh, welcome back after a thousand years. It's absolutely awesome. It's grouse. It very, very, he was very questioning of who they were, what they were. He checked the records. Oh, the discovery was destroyed a thousand years ago. Now you've suddenly popped up here and you would be suspicious about it all. Clearly the Federation is uh, you know, like hiding from something and they're a little bit iffy best as to what's going on. So in the, our heroes are expecting to be welcomed in like heroes effectively. And of course they've all been given this really suspicious treatment and that I really liked. It sort of made a lot of sense that that would occur. And because it all comes down to what you see from the audience's point of view. And of course we get to see everything and then you get you to see from characters on the in-universe point of view. So for Vance's point of view, the, the ship's just appeared out of nowhere. The crew's just appeared out of nowhere. What's the deal with that? And that is why I also like the interrogation sequence between all the characters. I thought that was really, really well done. And sure, when they get to explain their stories, oh, we've done this and we've done that and we've done this, we as the audience go, oh, yeah, that was good. I remember that episode and I remember that episode. But from the in-universe point of view, you can see why there'd be a lot of questions going, yeah, this isn't making a lot of sense at all because clearly the people or the holograms doing the questioning, they wouldn't have known what was happening a thousand years ago. So I thought it was really, really well done. Yeah, because we mentioned this before, they they um, they made the the whole idea of discovery sort of like it was killed the crew was killed and it was blown up and all that sort of stuff and the records were sealed that was silly that was just really silly on on the federation's behalf back then they should have maybe had a thing saying hey look you know in 500 years time we'll open it up and you know you'll all know that discovery was there it, it's almost like can we get over this sort of thing that you know you got these um uh the medical hologram who i thought was just a pain in the ass really he was a rude obnoxious worse than the doctor from voyager yeah with a different um, voice too and a few people are trying to work out what the deal was with that but uh, yeah go on it's like a magnetic resonance it's sort mm. of like they you know you want to differentiate him from being human i, mm. I think um one of the other things that i found interesting is that michael says we've got loads of experience right and i thought but hang on that's 22nd century experience that's not 32nd century experience and i thought well it sounds good in theory, but in practice, it'd be like, yeah, but everything that you know is out of date, effectively, you know. But as it turns out, and this is kind of the iffy bit of the entire episode, right? So the episode, the ship's turned up, and as is often the case in science fiction shows where there's a bit of time traveling involved, but I call it the Buck Rogers syndrome, right? Right, where the heroes, the 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 local kids, are just way smarter than the futuristic people. Okay, so they've turned up to Admiral Vance and that, and Admiral Vance is going, well, listen, they've got this race of aliens here. They've like been poisoned by this particular thing. They're dying. And our crew, the heroes from a thousand years ago, oh, we had to fix that. That came from this planet over here. And this was on this ship over there. And we're going to have to fix this thing over here. How convenient. And it makes the local, the smart, the new people look like a bunch of idiots. And mm. it's a very, very common trope for science fiction time traveling stories. Anyway, and they could have referenced that very uh, easily. All he had to all he had to say was, you know, computer, do we have a ship with a seed bank on it, basically? And they would have gone, yeah, it would have been this. And, you know, because all of a sudden, um, Michael has has it on the data pad, who the family is looking after. It's like, yeah. you already had the info. What's You had 32nd yeah. century info on a 23rd century ship. How does that work? So, obviously, you knew 
that, that someone doesn't know how to research in the 32nd century. Well, the irony is, of course, that they happen to say, oh, everything was kept on the teak of. And you go, oh, fancy, that's still flying around, you know, like it's a later <laughs> iteration of it. But how good is that? It didn't blow up in the burn when the dilithium crystals went ta-da. It's like, it's still hanging in there. And it was like, how lucky is that? And they go, oh, look, it's based way over like a thousand kilometers away. Don't worry, we've got the spore drive. We'll just wire it up and away we go. And it was just way, way, way too convenient. And, uh, you know, in the end, they'll kind of come back and say, well, you saved the day just in the nick of time, as you do. And uh, and it's all like, yeah, right, whatever. I think they could have done a little bit more with that, you know, made it a little bit harder. The whole idea of when they got to the seed ship, why didn't they just bring the whole thing with them? Yeah. They got in the tractor beam. Yep. Let's just take the, put it in the docking bay, flip it back, go back to the Federation, go, here you are, you're all safe and sound now. And, of course... In the story, we lose the uh, Commander Nan. She just says, oh, no, I'm just going to stay here. A few people are wondering why they've done that because the actress has moved up to the main cast and she's just said, no, I'm going to stay put now. And uh, so, and she didn't even get to say farewell to anybody. You know, it says farewell oh. to Michael. It's like, well, what about all the other friends on the bridge? They were just like, oh, we're just going to nick off and leave you there. It's like, yeah, that was a whole moment that was just missed. So clearly you, so you would think she's going to come back at some point because normally when someone's leaving for good, it's a big teary goodbye and whatever else. So um, a few extra things that have sort of popped up along the way. Uh, and there is, of course, there's the big uh, topic to discuss and we'll bring that up at the very end. Um, uh, good old Reno has come back. So it's, we were seriously missing her from the dinner scene uh, last week. She would have been awesome in that, but she's back here and she's saying it's raining Starfleet officers, which is just absolutely <laughs> funny. <laughs> So she's just a winner no matter what. Uh, I thought that was actually uh, really, really good to see. And uh, there was a thing of like what's happening with um, Giorgio. It's like, you know, the uh, this brings us to the whole, the the biggest question mark of the entire thing, David Cronenberg appearing in his glasses and his tie and all the rest. It completely stands out. He might as well be wearing like a fluorescent jacket. It's just so he can stand out from the crowd. Uh, as to who he is, and everybody's speculating, is he Section 31? Is he a hologram? Uh, what's the deal with that? And, of course, he clearly knows about who she is in the Terran Empire, and, of course, she doesn't know about that because she's just jumped right over that entire timeline, gets to where we are now, and he goes, oh, yeah, the Terran Empire fell. And, yeah, she would be a bit upset about that. So, yeah, well, yeah her, her interrogation was completely different to the rest of them, you know, mm -hmm. like Tilly's telling about the time when she, you know, straightened her hair and all that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. and um and and what's her name reno was 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 hungry during the interrogation which i thought was classic um but philippa she's sort of sitting there and all of a sudden she knows this this way how to disrupt the holograms it's like hang on a second where's this info coming from you know like you've been there for you know a couple of days maybe and you've already got info on how to disrupt holograms which we've never heard of before and you know i don't think he's a hologram per se because obviously he flipped the um the communicator to her and then she just broke that because you know she likes to break things um but the question is then who is she favoring uh who does she like sort of thing if she's hanging around because she's obviously hanging around for a reason i think there's a couple of reasons um i think she's hanging around because she's got nowhere else to go really and she's sort of there's that familiarity with the 32nd century being in discovery and the fact that she's still looking after Michael, even after, you know, being part of the Terran Empire and all that sort of stuff. I still think she's got that soft spot for her that she's probably going to turn and hoping that she might turn back to the, the Michael that she knew, not the Michael that is currently there. Well, it's very interesting because some people are starting to speculate whether the Georgia we see at the end, who's just, you know, looking off in the distance in the in the corridor, is actually a real person, you know, like the real character, or a hologram. So it is conceivable with the hologram thing being the way it is and they're popping up all over the place that most of the people you're seeing on that station are all fake. So it'd be curious to see where all that's leading to. Um, so one thing that we mentioned in previous episodes that some people thought the Federation was now the Vidraish, as it was still a word I can't pronounce correctly, and now that doesn't seem to be the case at all. So maybe the Vidraish are the ex-Federation planets that were all banded together, the other 250, whatever it happens to be. So maybe that's what that is. Who knows? We'll probably get that in later on down the track. Uh, some people have also worked out and said, okay, the Discovery has a spore drive. Well, why didn't all the engineers just go, oh, my God, we've got to go and check that out, unless they just scanned the ship and go, yep, we've got everything we need to go 32nd century scanning technology they can then try and replicate that because you think that would be the highest priority out of absolutely everything uh which is funny because in the original season of discovery they're trying to avoid doing that you know replicating the spore drive because you know it's the mycelium network and it damages things and hurts things and whatever and you'd think now without dilithium and without warp drive that it'd be the highest priority ever 
get the small mm. drives working in all their starships, get the Nog sailing off all around the place and the Voyager J herbing around here, there and everywhere, just like pop it up when you least expect it. And that'd be like the Federation be rebuilt in no time. So uh, there you go. How good is that? Yeah, maybe that's their, their cheat later on for, yeah. for their ships. Which is kind of dangerous because then it, there's no challenge anymore. You're right. Oh, we need to go to the Delta Quadrant. Bang, we're just there. You know, there's like, it just happens and yeah, it would be pretty boring. Um, it was very interesting. Saru mentioned about a uh, the Renaissance, right? And the Giotto character and all the rest of it. And then said, yeah, you got about looking up and changing the world and all the rest of it. Some people have actually looked at that line and said, is he talking about, as in the characters talking about the 32nd century, or is it the writers talking about 2020 this year, about everything's been so crap this year in our world, maybe we need a bit of Giotto action and start looking up for 2021. I was like, oh, okay, so that can be interpreted in two different ways, which I thought was kind of interesting. So uh, yeah, it's getting a bit deep and meaningful, isn't it? So uh, any further thoughts on Die Trying before we rate the episode? What do you reckon, MPS? Uh, yeah, there's a couple more. I love the new beaming technology. They're in and out like that. It's yeah. so quick. It's not like this, and they're gone. They're just you know what? instantly. It's spore drive for, for transporters. That's what it is. Just reappear magically somewhere else. I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a distance limit, but it's, it's the same principle, really, when you think about it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that the thing that bugged me a little bit was noticing at the end when the Admiral and... and um, Saru and Michael are walking and the floor starts reappearing underneath them. It's yeah. Like, why wouldn't you just have a solid floor? Is is if you're running or in a hurry or something and that floor doesn't doesn't appear there, you know, it just it, seems a bit strange. It could be based more on a holodeck technology. Uh, so maybe the physical they don't need to physically build anything anymore. And it's all just, I mean, there's a lot of like techno babble for this mm. stuff, but maybe they they say, well, if you need to walk from here to there and there's just gap a gap between a wall a floor will suddenly appear but if you need to go from there to there a floor will appear but you don't have to build a floor going in both directions i know it's a bit unusual maybe it's trying to be clever for the sake of being clever because we are supposed to be in the future and they're thinking well okay so wherever you go there's always a path for you there's no such things as chasms it's like oh there's a big gap in the middle i know you can just walk straight across that a floor will just appear maybe that's the logic behind that and then it just disappears behind you. So yeah, in, in, when you think about it, it's probably not such a bad idea. So, uh, but uh, yeah, something different. Yeah. And that whole feeling right at the end where they, where Michael and Saru were sort of talking um, in their, in the same spot they were talking at the start of the episode. Mm. And they're saying they just don't feel like they're at the Federation. They don't feel like they're, they're sort of home yet. They sort of resembled a, a thing as like when you start a new job, you know, you, you don't feel part of that that workplace or, you know, you, you join a new club or whatever the case is. You don't quite feel the same until you've been there for a little bit of time or you've <laughs> interacted in such a certain way. So maybe by the end of season four or five, they'll feel like part of the Federation again. Well, I mean, yeah, it was always going to look different no matter what. And uh, it is kind of funny that they've got all the, they've got, all, they've got there. Now they're just going to nick, <laughs> nick off again. And, anyway. Doesn't matter. Not important. Anyway, so we're going to rate this episode in PS. Die trying. So in, in, in Federation logos. So out of five Federation logos, what did you give this episode? Oh, you only got a three from me this week. Oh, Jeez. harsh but true. Harsh but true. Golly, you're a tough, tough nut. Um, I really enjoyed the whole Federation thing, the A story. I really wish they had a stuck with that. Uh, I would have rated this a lot higher. Had they not worried about the seed thing, that was just a bit of a, you know, a bit of fluff off the side. And, you know, it's like it came, it went, and, you know, it's like whatever. You wanted to stick with the A story, which so I gave it, I would have given it four and a half stars, but I've knocked it back to four because of the seed thing. I thought, you know, we, we're mucking around with these dudes and they're you know, trying to find the secure for this thing. It's like, no, nah, no, nah, get back to the core story. Get back to the Cronenberg, you know, Georgia sort of conversation and what's going on with all that. And uh, so I think the distraction was a bit, a bit unfortunate, but uh, maybe it'll, uh, uh, pave the way for something extra further down the track but uh, other than that no uh, I actually quite liked it I thought it was good and we we're actually moving in the right direction too so be very curious to see how it all transpires from here on out and of course there's clearly some bad dudes out there because the Federation is hiding and they're not liking full view with a big sign saying here we are come and join us so something's going on so uh, we'll have to wait and see but maybe we'll have to wait and see next week because uh, that's when the next episode is on oh it's all very exciting stuff so uh, in the interim, we're going to buzz off now. And uh, in, as they always say, keep on trekking. Until then, see you later. Okay, bye. There. Yeah.